Welcome everyone to the Stockholm Security Conference of 2022, um, the seventh in the series, and this year very much devoted to and dominated by uh, events in, in Ukraine and the ongoing conflict. Um, this is a panel which is going to talk about why it was impossible um, to stop the invasion of 24th of February. Uh, and what we can learn from that failure to apply in the future um, to reduce the risk that there will be new fighting and new conflict. Uh, since this session was planned, um, events have actually made discussion of conflict prevention more challenging. Um, President Putin has proclaimed that four territories that are part of Ukraine are annexed to Russia, in addition to the territory of Crimea. And President Zelensky has underscored that under present conditions, any negotiations with Russia are impossible. Um, so it will be a matter for the warring parties, Ukraine and Russia, when and how to terminate the fighting. Uh, and the developments on the battlefield will shape the conditions for future talks. Um, but at some point, there will be an end to the fighting, uh, and it will be necessary to put in place arrangements that make sure that isn't just a brief interlude before a new round of conflict. So we have a fantastic panel to help us uh, talk about this, this um, issue and, and uh, address the, these questions um, about which factors and elements will be decisive um, for a stable and enduring um, peace uh, between Ukraine and Russia. Um, I'm not going to introduce the panelists at length because we have a limited time. You can find their um, biographies on the conference homepage, uh, where you'll find um, uh, biographies of, of each of the of the panelists. Um, but I'd like to turn first to to Yulia um, Yulia Osmolovska. Um, of course, after 2014, uh, Yulia, there have been plenty of discussions around the situation in Ukraine. But obviously, they were not successful in preventing the invasion on 24th of February. Um, from your perspective, why do you think they failed? Um, what can we learn from that failure that could be applied in future um, to make sure any agreement is not just an interlude between um, the fighting? Yeah. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, so, uh, answering your question, I have to start to much earlier than 2014, uh, because I've been working at the Minister of Foreign Affairs at that time, uh, doing um, strategic uh, agreements with the European Union. And actually, uh, my personal observation is that uh, we've uh, made mistakes as Ukrainian diplom diplomats. At that point, uh, when we started to, to highlight our intentions to join European Union and NATO, but we haven't thought at all about how Russia might take this, what uh, Russia will be doing in terms of securing their interest and uh, uh, how they would retaliate to that. And uh, we haven't been preparing actually for any worst case scenario. So therefore, uh, when Russians realized that uh, our negotiations with the EU are getting serious, this happened in March, 2013, they started to push harsh with all the negative scenarios, including the military one. So this uh, has led to the February 2014. And then we also need to understand what happened next. Uh, because as I said, our first mistake was that we were politically short-sighted. We didn't have this strategic uh, advance uh, uh, um, perception of what might uh, uh, have hap what might uh, will happen and uh, uh, how should we actually be prepared to that. So second one uh, was that um, we were completely ignorant as well as uh, the West uh, currently does with regards to the Russian model of negotiations, which is completely different from the one uh, which has been widespread in the West based on the theory of rational choice, uh, the so-called uh, hard negotiation model, which is win-win. So basically, um, uh, Russians are playing a completely different game. I've studied this at uh, St. Petersburg at the Faculty of Psychology, and actually to find out that Russians' model of negotiation 
is of irrational thinking. So they tend not to have a seemingly beneficial uh, decision for them, uh, but so they highly value such uh, things like intangibles and negotiations, like respect, authority, inclusion, and all this kind of stuff. So, and we actually were quite ignorant about uh, uh, deceitful tactics that Russians are using within this Russian negotiation matrix. Like for instance, uh, they've done uh, in uh, summer 2014, leading to uh, Ilovaisk cloud drone. So basically, uh, this method is known as creating time pressure and extreme urgency for the other side uh, to be ready to have some uh, settlement. And this is actually forced our president, the then president Poroshenko, to sign uh, already imperfect Minsk One agreements. Similar trick had been played by Russians in uh, uh, January and uh, uh, February 2015 with Donetsk and the Balsava cloud drones. And actually, the negotiations uh, in the Monday format uh, of the top level run for 18 hours, actually. This is another tactic that Russians are using just to make exhaustion of partners or opponents in negotiations. And this had led to already systemic imperfect Minsk, Minsk II accords. Our president uh, was not actually authorized or he, he was not given the mandate from the Ukrainian uh, public actually to have this uh, settlement and agreement on these terms. And this has led actually to the understanding that Minsk II cannot be implemented without breaking the statehood of Ukraine. And therefore, all these in, uh, next years uh, were just imitation of negotiations or manipulation from Ukrainian side, because uh, uh, every move um, uh, with regard to implementing at least one of the position of the provision of the agreements, especially uh, with regard to giving more authority to the so-called People Republic in the East, had met with severe criticism inside the country. And therefore, the president was extremely uh, limited, actually, in his actions. And therefore, the whole negotiation process in the Romandi format and Minsk format just uh, had led to nowhere. And Russians just seemingly lost their patience uh, in 2021 because they were interested in, in having these Minsk II agreements implemented, because they even explicitly stated that uh, these were this was their diplomatic victory and they were pressing ukrainian side to implement the provisions of it so it didn't happen as you know and therefore russians lost their patience they um, uh, made the first step with this ultimatum against nato in december 2021 and actually we had to read this as not the desire to negotiate the agreement but rather as the pretext for their next invasion into ukraine so um, uh, what we have to do uh, now, uh, we have to learn from these mistakes and to understand that we need to enter negotiations with, Ru with Russia only from the position of more power than Russia in negotiations. That means that at the moment, Ukraine and their Western partners and its Western partners have to invest a lot to increase Ukraine's negotiation power and to uh, rise uh, stakes for Russia, meaning to uh, uh, rise their negative alternatives for Russia to be a more a softer and weaker in negotiation position and ready at least to get into substantive talks. Because right now what you can see, it's just uh, Russians having a uh, losing actually uh, uh, on the battlefield and being a uh, losing side in negotiations, actually still pressing with this ultimatum they presented Ukraine with in February this year. So they even don't uh, adjust their initial demands. And at the moment, uh, uh, right, right now, it's not the moment for um, uh, negotiations because Ukrainians also are not uh, ready for that. Uh, because the moment for negotiation comes when both sides understand that they can't improve the status quo unilaterally by their own actions, and they hate to get involved into this joint problem solving. Right now, Ukraine winning on the battlefield, having more military assistance from the West coming in, effect of sanctions uh, and uh, internal turmoil in, in, in Putin inner circle, uh, leaves all of us with understanding that Ukrainians actually could defeat Russia on the battlefield. And uh, uh, then getting back to internal stakeholders, Ukrainian society, 98% of Ukrainians believe 
uh, in armed forces of Ukraine, and uh, over 90% believe that Ukraine can repel Russia on the battlefield. Therefore, even if our president would have wanted uh, to get into negotiations with Russia, it would be met with extreme protests within the Ukrainian society, and he understands this. Therefore, the president came up recently with uh, the four points in his uh, understanding when it uh, will be the moment to come into negotiations with Russia. Uh, Russia uh, withdrawing from the territory of Ukraine till the borders 1991, uh, respect to UN Charter and international order, uh, punishment of all the war criminals, um, uh, repayments uh, for uh, the destructions Russians made uh, in Ukraine, reparations, and uh, only then Ukrainians could be ready actually to consider next stage for negotiations. But in order to, uh, you ask the question, how we could ensure um, uh, uh, durable peace with Russia. Uh, this is the trick of U Ukraine's neutrality here. You've seen with the Sweden and uh, uh, with Sweden and Finland that neutrality is no longer the best uh, possible option of actually securing um, uh, of uh, um, cementing security, uh, especially for the countries uh, which by destiny has to share the border with a very assertive and aggressive neighbor. So uh, neutrality is a very good instrument for a uh, assertive country, which actually could declare that, oh, I'm going to be neutral at some stage and won't pose any threat to the neighbors. But if um, a smaller country nearby would stay neutral, it always will, will be temptation for an assertive and aggression country to enter in. So uh, my uh, <laughs> remedy to this situation is that uh, uh, once the war is over, hope it will, we will see the end next year, uh, Ukraine then have to use this window of opportunity to join NATO. Thank you. Um, that's something we'll probably come back to in the in the discussion and within the panel. But um, uh, I'd like to turn next to you, William, if I could. Um, of course, one of the things that was being watched closely before 24th of February was the buildup of Russian forces uh, around the border of Ukraine. Um, that was being tracked both with national intelligence capabilities, but also through the various instruments that exist in Europe um, to provide transparency over military matters. Um, was there something we needed to see but we didn't see um, that would require changes either in the way we collect information or the way that we assess it in order to bring some uh, more coherent shared position in advance of a crisis? What, what was it that we were missing and what is it we need to do next? So, uh, I mean, I think the thing that we were missing is political will to see what we see. Um, just like with the Georgia invasion, I recall actually before the Georgia invasion, I, I was in the US government, I was working on arms control, and I did a memo uh, just taking all the OSCE reports. Uh, Russia had sent road and rail troops into Abkhazia. They had shot down a UAV with a jet fighter. They had rocketed a village. Um, and then they had an exercise on Georgia's border, um, um, uh, Kafkaz, uh, 2008. Um, and when they sent the notification to the OSCE, they had the start date, but they didn't put an end date. And I put that all together to my boss and I said, look, all the, all the indications from arms control seem to say that this is an invasion. And uh, I was told, no, 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 Russia would never do that. Uh, 2014, I didn't see that one coming. I can't claim to have seen that one, but 20, uh, February, 2022, Again, just you know, looking at the movement of forces, um, it was clear. But if but if you don't have the political will to act, if you don't want to see it happening, uh, there's really no information that we can provide you that will help. That said, let's talk about what the tools were that were extant at that moment and what they could have and should have done. Um, first of all, just in context, all inspections under arms control were suspended back in March and April of 2020, and they have not resumed yet. So. Uh, for instance, new start you see in the news at the end of November, the parties are going to meet to try to figure out how to how to restart inspections. Uh, so that means we don't have the on the ground options that we would have had uh, had arms control been in place. But in general, four big agreements, the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe Treaty, CFE, the Vienna document, uh, GEMI, the Global Exchange of Military Information, and the Open Skies Treaty. Um, so let's go through. First of all, CFE, Russia's not been participating since 2007. And that actually makes it much more convenient for them because the CFE treaty provides you with exquisite understanding of exactly where all of your battle tanks, armored personnel carriers, combat aircraft, attack helicopters, 
uh, and artillery pieces are at any given moment. Uh, and you can go and inspect and see whether they're there or not. Now we did have CFE in Belarus, but again, we couldn't inspect. But what that treaty also does is it gives you a notified command and force structure. So where all your bases are from uh, the DOD head, MOD headquarters all the way down in the CFE treaty to the separated battalion. And they have to declare how much uh, equipment they have there. So in theory, you could even in Belarus have looked at the declarations for where equipment is and changes in how much equipment is at a different facility, they also have to declare that. So at least through the annual exchange of military information under the CFE treaty uh, and the notifications in Belarus, you'd have some idea of where the stuff was. Um, under, uh, yeah, there are four inspections uh, into Belarus a year, but you could also pay if Belarus agrees to do more inspections. Um, and also Ukraine. Uh, during the 2014 crisis, we had lots and lots of inspections going into Ukraine um, throughout 2014, actually, to try to dissuade Russia from uh, pushing further west. Then you've got the Vienna document. Vienna document, again, you have an annual exchange of your notified command and force structure. This goes down to the brigade level. Uh, Russia is in this, so it is very useful. You could actually see how many battle tanks they have at different facilities, uh, APCs, artillery, etc. Um, so we could have seen if there were any systemic changes uh, or large-scale deployments. The other thing, of course, is you have to notify deployments or exercises. Any grouping of soldiers outside of your base has to be notified when it exceeds 9,000 troops. And then you are supposed to invite all the 56 other participating states to come and look when you have more than 13,000 troops involved. Um, of course, Russia has never allowed an observation on its territory. Um, they gave a voluntary one during the Second Chechen War, but they've said that since 1991, none of their exercises have ever been more than 13,000 troops west of the Urals. I'll also say that CFE and Vienna document both only declare equipment west of the Urals, which is why during the CFE reduction period of the initial stage of the treaty, Russia moved a lot of stuff east of the Urals. This is why you keep seeing uh, battle tanks being taken out of storage east of the Urals and being shipped uh, on rail uh, into Russia. Uh, you also have the Open Skies Treaty, very famous. The U.S. has pulled out of it, but Belarus is still in it, I think. But again, we're not flying it. And that allows you to overfly every square inch of a country's territory. Uh, very, very useful if you want to spot large-scale things moving or changes to infrastructure. It's not good at, hide at finding hidden tanks in the woods. You can, you know, you have to declare the flight path so you can move out of the flight path if you if you need to. But it is good for mass groupings, and it could have been useful in the early stages of the conflict. And then, of course, GEMI, the Global Exchange of Military Information. This is critical because you have to declare all of your equipment wherever it is on Earth um, and uh, in zones. So you can compare the Vienna document data and the GEMI data, and that tells you where Russia's forces are in gray zones, for instance, like um, South Ossetia, Akhazia, or occupied Ukrainian territory. But ultimately, the problem that we have is one problem in the West is we don't fuse arms control and intelligence uh, adequately. That needs to happen in the future. We need to use all of our arms control data uh, unified. Uh, countries like Germany, for instance, very much put a firewall in uh, uh, during the um, past 30 years. We have to get thinking again that Intel tells you what you should see. Arms control says what they they say that is there. That's the undisputed thing. And then you can say, well, our intel sees this and this and this. You go for an inspection. Both sides are there. If there's something there that's not declared, then you go to the political uh, sphere, you know, political, uh, like the Forum for Security Cooperation uh, for the Vienna document, and you discuss uh, what, what is not there. But ultimately, you have to take it seriously. And going back to political will, um, arms control is should be tied to intelligence to give you early warning of conflict. But it's like an alarm clock with a snooze button. And if you don't want your alarm clock to wake you up and you want to keep hitting snooze, that doesn't mean your alarm clock is broken. That means you need to be able to listen when you think there are arms control non-compliance issues. When you when arms control tells you something really bad, you have to take it seriously. And if you don't take it seriously, ultimately you erode the quality of the tool itself. And mm. I'll end it there. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. I mean, again, perhaps we come back to some of this in the discussion if we have time, but um it, it really raises the question of why Russia took arms control seriously at one time in the past and uh, no longer takes it seriously today. Got a good answer for that. Um, we'll come back to that, though. Yeah. yeah, I hope we can. It's a very interesting question, and I, I have views on it, and I'm sure you do. Um, but I'd like to turn next to, to Andrew. Um, 
I mean, one of the things that's come out of, of the conversation already so far is that there's not going to be any trust in in the future relationship between Ukraine um, and Russia if it's only based on diplomatic arrangements. Um, the arms control arrangements can be extremely helpful, as William has explained, but they're not sufficient. Um, and I think we can also predict that Ukraine will build its national capacity to defend itself as a, as a, as a form of reassurance. Um, but what kind of European architecture might we see develop? Um, Yuli has mentioned the idea of Ukraine in NATO, um, regional arrangements, perhaps with neighboring countries like Poland. How would you see the evolution of the European security architecture in ways that can um, help to produce this, uh, this st long-term stability that we're looking for? Oh, well, thanks, Ian. Let me preface my comments that I'm speaking in my private capacity as an analyst, and my views do not re reflect the, the position or policy of the Marshall Center. The Defense Department or the U.S. government, I'm speaking uh, here as, a, as an analyst and a scholar. Uh, I'd like to pick up on what William said, because I think this is absolutely fundamental, uh, the, the snooze button analogy. I wrote a piece recently about the European crisis of disbelief, and I think that crisis of disbelief is still regnant in many a capital in Europe. Uh, uh, this was not about whether the Russians complied or not complied with uh, you know, arms control agreements or whether diplomacy was effective or not. This was about three things in my view. One was the hard power deficit in Europe. Uh, Europe has effectively disarmed over the last 30 years. I work in Germany. And I see firsthand what has happened to the Bundeswehr and, and the air forces and, and the rest of it here. But it's really true all across the continent with very few exceptions. The second thing was precedent. You know, this wasn't the first time that, that uh, Putin was doing this. I mean, every single time he used military power, right, he scored a political uh, win. I mean, he invades Georgia in 2008. Uh, gets Nord Stream 1. He invades Ukraine in 2014, gets Nord Stream 2. He butchers the Syrians. He is a big kahuna, you know, in the Middle East now controlling immigration flows and all of that. So we created ample precedent by simply uh, not responding in a forceful way and not showing in any shape or form that we were looking at a new security environment, that we were going to invest in the military and rebuild NATO's European capabilities. Um, and I think the, uh, the kind of uh, biggest issue was that we had all the intel that we needed. We saw what was happening in terms of troop concentrations. Uh, in fact, the U.S. declassified vast amounts of intelligence, much more than we would usually do in order to deter and, and kind of convince the Russian side that we're tracking. Uh, historians will probably marvel why he actually moved. Had he not moved at that time, would have ended up with a huge egg in our faces and Nord Stream 2 would have been operational, you know, and the Europeans would have been as disunited and, and, and as disarmed as, as previously. So um, the key question, and Yuli, I think, raised this. We, in my view, we're having a conversation about the secondary uh, problem set if we talk about enlarging the EU into Ukraine. Uh, no, there's no way that Ukraine can be effectively rebuilt, reconstructed without its security uh, first anchored in some sort of a system. I am a proponent of bringing Ukraine into NATO. I think with the Finns and the, and the Swedes jumping into the alliance, it's absolutely clear that being a partner nation is not deterrence. It's, it's, it's not going to give you anything that you need. You need to be under Article 5, end of story. And and the Finns went from 25% to 75% literally overnight in terms of uh, NATO enlargement. So, so whether it's a, a full membership in NATO or some form of uh, security guarantee under the NATO umbrella that is credible, uh, without that, no private equity will invest a red cent in, in rebuilding Ukraine as this will be seen as a country under a constant threat. Which brings me to the most important thing, and, and it's, a, it's a hard power question for all, all in Europe. If you look at the rates at which munitions are being expended, if you look at, at the uh, rates at, at which equipment is being used up, uh, we don't have, I mean, we even in the United States, we have to look at our stocks and say, do we really have what it takes? And we're on the 24th drawdown, I believe, right now. But if you look at the Europeans, it's a joke. I mean, uh, most of the European armies today, at the rates at which the Russians especially are using uh, 
how it's our ammunition and, and missiles couldn't fight for longer than a day, maybe two. So we need to have a serious conversation about a recognizing that this is a system transforming war. There's no going back to the way things used to be. That's number one. Number two, that unless we address the question of Ukraine's security, remember this is now the, in my humble opinion, the, the best European army out there in the field, both in terms of its ability to operate, how it's trained, how it can use both military and commercial technology and, and battle test it. Uh, we're having a, a kind of a, a vacuous conversation if we're not including Ukraine's security into the larger security equation of Europe. It just doesn't make sense. Suffice it to say that in 1955, you know, we brought into NATO the country that, you know, only a decade later was blamed for, for setting Europe and the world on fire. So because we thought in realist terms, right? I'm saying Ukraine is now an essential component of European security. And the Ukrainians have demonstrated, in fact, timing is the last thing. I think Putin was convinced that he would score again because the Chinese and the Russians working as allies, and I use this judiciously, have created a two frontier crisis for us at a time when the joint force is formatted for only one theater. We're in the process of changing that, but he believed this was the time to do it. I will conclude by saying this, this first round, no treaty issues right now will address this. We are at war and I think the Europeans should focus on how they can assist the Ukrainians to actually stand their ground, defeat the Russian military in the field, because without that, any sort of frozen conflict idea in my book guarantees that Putin will rearm, re-engage, and we may have a wider war in Europe as a result. Thank you. Uh, um, Thomas, I'd, I'd like to turn to you next. Um, I mean, in your time at, at the OSCE, you, you were obviously fully aware of the, of the difficulties um, that were, were emerging in different parts of Europe, not only in Ukraine. Um, and you pointed all of, already at that time for a need to change um, and to think in different ways about how to address some of these problems. And, and, and since you left um, OSCE, I think we would all agree that the situation has become worse, not just in terms of European security, but also in terms of how the OSCE can play its full and proper role. Um, from your perspective, uh, what are the things that need to be done to, to try and, and, and create an environment where the tools that the OSCE has created can be applied in a constructive and useful way? Let me perhaps uh, you know, start by uh, uh, saying a few words on what I tried to do uh, in, in positioning, uh, in reforming uh, the OEC, and, and then uh, and, and perhaps then also a few words on, on how um, we impacted on, on you know, these two uh, overlapping uh, conflicts uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine and between Russia and, and the West, and, and then say a few uh, words on, on, on the way forward. Um, what I uh, wanted to do is basically two things. A, strengthen OEC's capacities uh, to act uh, by a number of institutional reforms. Many of these reforms were uh, of managerial and organizational in nature. You know, uh, stupid things like a management review, bringing the organization into the digital age, reforming the budget process, uh, modernizing uh, HR policies, you know, stuff like that, uh, just to make sure that um, uh, an organization, a multilateral organization is capable uh, of uh, uh, operating. And partly these uh, uh, reforms were successful, partly less uh, successful. Um, um, I'm not going to go into the details uh, why, um, but uh, let me turn to, to the second uh, objective, and that was positioning the organization, um, its uh, dialogue platform, its conflict management uh, tools, its arms control uh, uh, tools um, to participating states and, and you know, encourage states to use uh, the tools um, of cooperative security I in an age that was already very much dominated by, uh, by uh, deterrence uh, and where there was already, you know, the space for uh, detente, uh, for uh, cooperative elements uh, uh, were, uh, was, was already narrowing uh, at a, uh, a, a quite uh, a pace. 
now uh, briefly looking at you know how the OEC impacted um, on uh, uh, conflict management in Ukraine since 2014. I think the track record is very mixed. Uh, partly, uh, I think it, it, we were successful in uh, managing uh, uh, the crisis uh, uh, in 2014 in, in preventing further escalation of the conflict. I would say uh, what was fairly successful was uh, uh, the special monitoring mission to uh, Ukraine, the SMM. I think that uh, had a, a profound de-escalatory effect. Um, what was uh, not successful were attempts in 2014 to establish an inter-Ukrainian uh, dialogue platform from April uh, 2014 on. This was uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Ambassador Ishinger created, but then a couple of months later abandoned. Um, when it came to uh, efforts, you know, to kind of uh, um, manage the conflict resolution uh, platform uh, of the OEC, the trilateral contact group. I think, again, the track record is mixed. Partly, uh, it was successful in the sense that um, over uh, a certain time period, uh, we managed to bring ceasefire violations uh, to, uh, to, to quite uh, low levels. But when it came to addressing uh, uh, other issues, in particular also the political provisions of the Minsk agreements, uh, uh, there was basically uh, little appetite by both sides to really, you know, uh, implement the Minsk agreements. Again, we can come uh, go into uh, details uh, uh, later. So all in all, I would say a mixed track record, uh, but not all in all uh, uh, negative. Now, looking at uh, the, the wider uh, conflict between uh, Russia and the West, uh, here I would say uh, the OEC's track record is even uh, um, less uh, uh, convincing because uh, for many of the tools that the OEC would have uh, on offer, there was little interest by key stakeholders. And when I say key stakeholders, I mean uh, uh, both the United States, the Russian Federation, but also, of course, NATO taking important decisions on, for instance, using a platform like the Structured, structured Dialogue that you know, was brought in by the German OEC chairmanship in 2016, and then was not properly used to you know, to seriously discuss uh, military risk reduction, uh, uh, CSBMs, uh, not to speak of uh, you know, arms control, as uh, was uh, initially intended. And, and clearly here, you know, the responsibility uh, was on both sides and it was uh, 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 not only, you know, the, the Russians that did not uh, come along. Uh, the Vienna document uh, was mentioned uh, before. Uh, I mean, I uh, witnessed uh, how politicized the Vienna document modernization uh, process got. And there was clearly no genuine political will to come up with uh, a uh, Vienna document, you know, that would take into account, uh, um, you know, interests of all sides. Uh, so again, that was uh, an opportunity missed. Now, looking forward, I mean, uh, let's be very honest, the OEC is in deep, deep crisis right now. Eh? And uh, the OEC uh, uh, has not been able to play any significant role in lowering tensions in the buildup uh, uh, of Russian troops around Ukraine. And, and uh, since the 24th uh, of February, I think the OEC uh, has become uh, practically irrelevant when it comes to uh, um, managing uh, uh, the, the, the conflict. And of course, this uh, impacts also heavily on its perceptions, uh, on in its perception in capitals. Now, this is not going to change uh, uh, in the short term. So I think for the time being, what participating states should aim uh, at is simply preserving the organization. And uh, there are a couple of things uh, that need to be done within the next uh, one uh, to uh, one and a half years. And if not, the uh, organization is either going to disappear or uh, uh, becoming totally irrelevant. Uh, 
what needs to be done is mission mandates need to be extended. This is going to be up in the next couple of months. The organization needs a budget. Uh, again, it has had no budget uh, for more than a year. Uh, the organization needs a chair for 2024, and uh, the organization will need uh, a new leadership uh, uh, at the end of uh, next year. That is the what is called the big four, including the secretary general, need to be uh, uh, appointed or reappointed. And if there is no political understanding among the key stakeholders of the OEC that this is a matter of survival for the organization, the organization will uh, go down. Uh, and if it goes down, you know, we will uh, lose uh, its potential, its potential in the sense of monitoring at some point uh, a, a ceasefire or uh, assuming other monitoring tasks, uh, uh, you know, be it, for instance, among, uh, around nuclear power plants, um, we will uh, lose uh, the potential um, uh, of a platform for uh, military risk reduction, uh, uh, CSPMs, arms control, if uh, uh, one day the time is again uh, ripe uh, for these kinds of measures. And we would also use uh, a potential platform to conduct uh, um, a serious discussion um, on uh, the wider European uh, security uh, principles. Uh, but again, we all, uh, if we just exclusively bet on deterrence in the future, we don't need all of that. Um, if at some point we want to reintroduce some elements of cooperative security in a future European security and peace order, uh, I, I would argue the OEC could still be helpful, even though it doesn't look like it right now. Thank you so much. Again, um, points there, which I'm sure we'll return to in, later in the conversation. But I'd, I'd like to turn to you, Richard, as well, because um, uh, the UN Security Council in particular has been quite heavily criticized um, for the way in which the Ukraine war has been handled. And the, the criticism has been pretty harsh. Um, other parts of the UN system have performed better. Um, for, for example, the reporting on um, human rights violations and war crimes has, has been to a quite large degree dependent on, on UN instruments. Um, what, what's your assessment of the overall performance of the, of the UN um, after 24th of February? Um, what could be done to make the engagement of some of the parts of the UN system that do seem to have had a more direct operational effect, what can be done to make those more effective? Well, I mean, maybe before looking at the current performance of the UN, we should say a few words about why the UN was almost totally irrelevant to conflict prevention um, uh, in Ukraine. Um, you know, I think both Russia, but also Ukraine's friends very deliberately marginalized um, the UN uh, between 2014 and 2022. Um, uh, in 20. 18 or 2019, Poland was on the Security Council and suggested that maybe there should be a UN envoy for Ukraine. And that proposal was blocked not by the Russians, but by the French, because the French did not want any uh, UN envoy complicating Normandy format negotiations. Um, the Ukrainians, uh, for some years, uh, lobbied the UN to plan for the deployment of a Blue Helmet peace operation in Donbass. Um, that was something which both Thomas and I in different ways uh, were engaged with. Um, but to be honest, neither the Russians uh, nor again um, the French or the Germans really wanted to entertain that idea. And so uh, the UN was you know, largely excluded from discussions of operational conflict prevention uh, in the Ukrainian case. Um, prior to this year. Uh, when, when the war came into view this year, um, the US did uh, look at how to uh, use the UN as part of its conflict prevention strategy, but there was never any suggestion that the UN should be doing uh, shuttle diplomacy or negotiations. Um, the, the UN was used primarily as an amplifier for the Western public diplomacy campaign about the Russian buildup. And so uh, first at the end of January and then uh, 
on a number of occasions through February, uh, the US convened Security Council meetings, um, including one involving Secretary Blinken, uh, where it laid out its, um, its case uh, to prove that a Russian invasion was coming. But this was a public diplomacy strategy. There was an understanding that you know, the UN is a good place if you want to get your messages to the wider world about a, an oncoming conflict. There wasn't a suggestion that UN officials could actually um, really do anything about the looming crisis. I think it's also worth saying that Secretary General Guterres um, did irritate some diplomats uh, in New York in the first quarter of this year because he did not attempt to engage in any personal diplomacy around the conflict. Guterres was one of those well-informed people who believed it was all a bluff. He's admitted that. And so even when he met with um, President Putin at Beijing for the Winter Olympics, uh, we understand he didn't raise uh, the word Ukraine in, in their meeting. So, um, you know, the story of the UN engagement on Ukraine up until uh, February or March um, is uh, pretty disappointing. Um, it was only being used essentially as an amplifier um, for conflict warnings. Um, what's interesting is that I think the UN's performance since March uh, in some ways has been better than we would have predicted. Um, Guterres uh, took some time to find his feet, but he has actually developed a certain niche diplomatic role in the conflict. Um, he helped mediate the withdrawal of civilians from Azovstal um, back in April. And then he, working very closely with Erdogan, um, was one of the architects of the Black Sea uh, Grain Initiative, which you know, is one of the very few diplomatic successes we've seen around this war. And I think Guterres is probably one of the very small number of statesmen whose diplomatic credibility has actually risen uh, in the course of 2022, because he has been able to get some small concessions from the Russians. And we know that the Ukrainians and um, President Zelensky uh, like Guterres. They tell Guterres that um, they, like, they like having him working on their file. They don't want some alternative UN envoy. They, they like having the Secretary General there working on their behalf. In addition to Guterres, there are about 2,000 UN humanitarian staff in Ukraine. Um, they undertake a surprising number of um, humanitarian missions that don't get a lot of um, publicity. You know, the, the UN is not doing a bad job in terms of conflict mitigation uh, in Ukraine. But despite encouragement from quite a lot of members of the organization, Guterres continues to say that he doesn't think that he is yet in a position to try and mediate a conclusion to the conflict. So the UN is stuck providing conflict mitigation services. And as you say, um, the UN is part of the accountability architecture, which has emerged around Ukraine, but it's not doing conflict resolution. If we were to get finally to a moment where both sides were willing to uh, talk about peace, I, I think that Guterres might use some of this capital. He could be a factor in um, shuttle diplomacy facilitation around peace talks. Um, but I don't think he believes, as I say, that he's going to be a central actor in that process. If you did get some sort of ceasefire deal or peace deal, I can imagine that being brought back to the Security Council for affirmation. I can even imagine, although, although I think it's a low probability that the UN might have some role in monitoring the disengagement of forces, just as the UN actually had a role in monitoring the Soviet exit from Afghanistan. Um, but uh, beyond that, my sense is that the UN will only ever be a supporting actor in Ukraine. Um, the EU, uh, the US, other Western powers are not going to want the UN to play a central part in post-conflict issues in the country as it did in, say, Kosovo. Um, uh, and so the UN's role, I think, will continue to be uh, positive, but in essence, somewhat marginal. Thank you. Yes. Um, so thank you all so much for for these uh, for these these remarks. Um, I think it really opens the the way for for a great conversation. So if any of you want to pick up or respond to any of the points that have already been made, then please. Um, just let me know through the raise hand function, or I can actually see you all, so you can physically raise your hand. Um, but maybe I'll also um, feed in at least one of the questions which we've which we've received from from our audience, which actually touches on this question of uh, the potential for an independent role 
in, uh, in monitoring what's happening. We've seen one of the agencies that has assumed quite a prominent role now is the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, which has both the technical capability um, at a high level, as well as the legal agreements with states that allow it to, to play quite a powerful role in, in the inspections uh, related to nuclear safety and security. Um, if new, new conditions need some radical changes, is there a place for an independent European body with the type of technical capabilities and legal powers that the IAEA has um, in other areas? This is one of the questions that's been put by our audience. Um, but William, please. Thanks. Uh, so looping back to a question you asked, why did Russia take arms control seriously and now it doesn't? Um, I mean, it really depends on whether you want, whether you're a status quo power or a revisionist power. When you're a revisionist, when you're a status quo power, arms control is a useful tool to help maintain the status quo. When you're a revisionist power, it's a, it's a problem. And that's why Russia has very slowly been extricating itself from agreement after agreement. Um, or cheating and seeing how much the West will tolerate before it reacts. And so, for instance, you know, I would take very strong exception to what Thomas said. Russia, Russia, by its own claim, has never conducted an exercise in the Western military district or the Southern military district of more than 13,000 troops. That is hilarious. It is not true. And yet they'll, they'll declare we had a 90,000 person exercise but only 12,850 of them were countable under the Vienna document. You've heard the Vienna document just as I have. There's not countable or uncountable troops. They, they just don't do it. And then they see how we react. And when our reaction is, meh, what are you going to do? That's a problem. We, we don't take um, compliance seriously. On the Vienna document proposal, I negotiated directly with the Russians. We even told them we're going to take Russian proposals to modify the Vienna document. We're going to use them in our proposal. And they said to me, look, there is no appetite for transparency in Moscow. There is not. We want to use arms control to instrumentalize it in order to get what we want, which is to inhibit Western actions. And so when you have that lack of common purpose, you can't get anywhere. And they even explained to me, look, our position is the same as the Bush administration's position on arms control. So we both want the same things, but just at different times. Um, so I, I would say that, that really Russia's interest is in weaponizing risk, it's in hiding things, it's in being able to surprise us and to hopefully create fear that then makes us internalize inhibition. And as long as that's what they want and not positive some outcomes or common security, then we're gonna have a problem. It's, it's interesting how people remember the agreements of the early nineties. Um, my recollection is that the interest of the Soviet Union and then Russia was essentially to put a floor underneath the collapsing system that um, the Soviet Union's collapse and Russia's difficulties meant that they couldn't sustain the levels of investment in the military or reconstruct the system which had been smashed, whereas the West could continue indefinitely. So there was a very strong Russian interest in putting a floor under this um, rapid descent. And, and uh, I think it links to Yulia's point that negotiating from strength until you recreate conditions like that, probably there won't be a very serious conversation. Um, but uh, but uh, Thomas, you asked for for the floor. Uh, mainly to uh, answer uh, the uh, monitoring uh, question, but just briefly, you know, on on my perception uh, of uh, let's say um, uh, CSPM's um, um, implementation and and modernization uh, during the last. Uh, six, seven, eight years. Um, I, I wouldn't contest, uh, uh, of course, your assessment that the Vienna document wasn't implemented to its spirit and, uh, and, and, and the fact that uh, Russia indeed conducted uh, uh, huge uh, exercises that were just you know, technically split up in different ones in order to uh, uh, avoid uh, notification. I mean, I, I don't contest that. Uh, when it comes um, uh, uh, to the process of modernizing the Vienna document, there I clearly have uh, uh, a, a different assessment. Uh, and here, I think there are two uh, things. One is content of a modernization. 
And, and I think the Russians would only have been interested in a, in a, a, a comprehensive modernization if uh, the scope uh, would have been uh, extended and they had no appetite. And I more or less quote uh, uh, Russian officials, they had no appetite uh, on more uh, transparency on on Rus Russian troop movements, uh, while you know uh, anything that would interest them regarding uh, the Western posture, uh, regarding naval, regarding rapid deployment, etc., would not uh, be part of the scope. So I think that there was uh, uh, there was no interest in the type of uh, modernization that was put forward. But then I think from a psychological point of view, even more important was the process. And uh, uh, perhaps Russia accepted in the 90s uh, a process whereby a proposal was cooked up in Brussels and then shipped to Vienna and, and there uh, basically on a take it or leave it uh, basis uh, um, uh, decided upon. But this clearly would not have worked uh, in in recent years. But th th that is exactly what what uh, what what happened. But now, actually, I wanted to respond to the monitoring question. You, you know, monitoring is not only a matter of capacities; it's also very much a matter of trust. And you know, for a while, uh, the OEC uh, had that trust by key stakeholders, including by the Russian Federation, and this trust um, um, uh, has been lost. And so, while I would advocate the OEC would uh, be able uh, to uh, do monitoring tasks of quite different nature, uh, I think it's not so difficult, you know, to bring in specific technical capacities once you know how to uh, organize uh, um, an operation, set it up, etc. And all for all of this, the OEC has a good tr track record, but the issue is the trust has gone and. This is also why this idea of hibernating SMM, the special monitoring mission to Ukraine, failed. Uh, this, this would have been the ideal uh, tool, uh, hibernated until uh, you know uh, there is uh, uh, development on the ground that would allow for a redeployment. And uh, but this uh, was uh, refused by the Russian Federation because they have lost this trust in the OEC. Now, they seem to have uh, more trust in an agency like the IAEA. Um, I would, of course, also argue that one should try to rebuild trust uh, once you know, we reach the point where we, uh, again, can start negotiating uh, uh, such deployments. Hmm. Thank you so much, um, Andrew. I, I saw your hand first, but then it went down again, and now I see Yulia. So I'm going to actually give the floor to Yulia first and then come back to you, if that's okay. Yeah, so Yulia, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I wanted to dwell a bit more about this issue of uh, uh, interlocutor or um, a mediator in negotiations and uh, the role of UN and uh, OEC in this regard. Yes, definitely we've been seeing a lot of efforts of OEC being uh, invested in the, uh, channeling this communication at least uh, since 2014. But actually we should understand uh, that uh, there are two key parameters uh, by which an efficient mediator is judged. It has to be impartial and it has to have um, enough authority actually for the both conflicting sides to be able at least to listen to him and uh, uh, to, to try to incorporate what, what uh, the mediator is saying. And by Russia behavior right now, we see that regretfully uh, both OEC and UN are being disrespected and disregarded by Russia. So uh, as well as uh, uh, Russia has played in Normandy format at, at some stage. So uh, uh, they were not, um, uh, very much referring actually to high authority or at least to some sort of uh, respectable opinion of France and Germany in this regard. Just let me recall uh, the diminishing uh, uh, letters uh, sent by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia in uh, uh, November last year, uh, revealing the dipl diplomatic correspondence with the French and German partners and actually almost blaming them to take the Ukrainian side. So. Um, 
Therefore, it now we come to the understanding that uh, if we are to see some sort of efficient mediators right now, we have to judge them from these two parameters for Russia to be able actually to listen to them. And therefore, at some point uh, in the past, I came with this. I came up with this speculative idea, uh, which was shared by my colleagues from US and and UK, that uh, they probably might have been uh, US, China, probably EU, as um, and Ukraine and Russia and. and the negotiation table at some point in the future. But uh, another problem with all this kind of uh, uh, mediators is that we have so many negotiation formats and used to have uh, since the beginning of uh, uh, 2014 that for Russia, it just creates a very good um, uh, environment actually to pick. Uh, it's like a, a la carte menu. So they pick up the most comfortable channels for them and then they speculate on, on that and just play with this bad and good cop game. So this all, all the said of me and, and the colleagues that speak before uh, leads again to my uh, conviction that definitely we need to study more and to learn more, especially our Western partners, the Russian negotiation approach, the Russian negotiation models, because it's diametrically different from the Western approach. So if you see the uh, your uh, um, partners in negotiations, because you've been developed on this culture of uh, a consensus seeking within NATO or EU. So you basically already predetermined that you have to come to some common sense and common ground on the win-win terms. The Russians are pursuing uh, their uh, opponents as foe, as a rival. So for them, uh, negotiations are another part of uh, of uh, the, the fight. So therefore, uh, we've got the plenty of these tools and tricks of Russia. We can even decode their psychological uh, uh, moves. So, and uh, this is for my call to you would be, before we sit up to negotiate uh, with Russia, at some point, either Ukraine or our Western partners on completely different issues, then we definitely need to be well equipped with their school and then to be able to offset them at negotiation table. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Andrew, I'd like to come to you next because I did recognize earlier that you had your hand up, but uh, yeah. Thank you. It was a slightly raised hand, and then I thought I, I was good. Uh, I want to I want to just touch on something that Yulia just said because I I have to admit at the risk of, of sounding like a broken record, I've got a sense of a touch of unreality in a lot of the conversations about negotiating with Russia and and mediation and finding a solution. All of this stipulates that uh, somehow we we may end up at a at least pause in the fighting and then try to let the diplomatic processes work. Any, any sort of pause in the fighting, any armistice, however brief, is a Russian win under these circumstances, both in terms of the territory and what, what they have accomplished. And so um, I think we're having, again, just like in the case of uh, talking about EU enlargement someday eventually for Ukraine, right? Uh, rather than talking about what's staring us in the face, which is the security dilemma of that country. Uh, how do you actually create conditions? Uh, I just sat through a, a discussion about, you know, uh, aid for Ukraine, another Marshall Plan for Ukraine, you know, numbers are tossed around. Uh, I'm sorry, but this is science fiction. You know, a Ukraine that does not have the capacity to not only uh, secure itself, but in fact, to be anchored in a larger security architecture, uh, we'll never get to that stage. And the second point is, yes, NATO is united, but NATO is, is united largely uh, when it comes to messaging and rhetoric. Uh, there's a very different uh, level of, of appetite when it comes to risk-taking. Uh, I call it regionalization of European security optics. When I'm in, in Riga or in Tallinn or in Warsaw or, or in Bucharest, there's a very keen sense of what this is about. It's about Russia. It's about the neo-imperial drive. Uh, when I'm in Berlin, the conversation becomes uh, a slightly different. When I'm in, in Paris, it's all about Europe's southern border and, you know, in the Maghreb and, and wherever we want to look at it or, or in the Sahel. Um, my point is that what's missing is a sense of policy consensus and an understanding that, as Yulia put it, we are in a protracted conflict with a revisionist Russian state for the last two decades, ever since Putin started spinning the narrative of the great Russian people betrayed you know, by, by the politicians from Lenin through Yeltsin, through Gorbachev, you name it. Uh, and then he's going to restore that greatness. Uh, 
Uh, Europe made horrendous mistakes by, by pursuing an energy policy that made itself dependent on Russian gas. And you know we can go into a separate conversation why. But if you go in the case of Germany from something like uh, you know, 35% dependence on Russian gas to the eve of the war in Ukraine, 55% dependence. You've got remaining three nuclear reactors, two of which will still remain as a backup. And you pursue energy policy completely disconnected from national security concerns. Then you end up where you end up. I think Putin calculated that he was going to exploit once again the weakness of Europe. So to just close this intervention, this is about hard power. All the institutions, UN, OSCE, failed, and and I think uh, Richard is spot on that you know maybe with a few shining moments of the of the secretary trying to do something, these institutions are largely irrelevant today. NATO has a new lease on life, but the jury is still out whether NATO will actually deliver, because if the if this is just political declarations without real hard power, and remember it'll take a decade, considering how devastated the the, the defense. Uh, infrastructure is in Europe, not just not just you know uh, uh, in terms of production. I'm talking about military mobility. I'm talking about bridges being raided to carry you know the the, the modern heavy tanks with heavy trailers and and the rest of it. Um, we have demonstrated from the U.S. side that we're willing to bridge for that period. We doubled our military deployments. We showed once again that only the U.S. can do the kind of logistical operation that's needed. But the Europeans need to step up because if the Europeans do not step up, then we can have another strategic concept written out there. But the fate will be uh, pretty predictable. Thank you as well. Um, we're actually speaking on the day that the new Swedish government presented its draft budget, where it's the biggest increase in military spending since the 1940s. So I think the, the message is received in, in capitals. Um, and Richard, I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, of course, you should say whatever it was that you were planning, but just read in some of the questions which are also coming in the in the Q and A. One is about the issue of how to strengthen diplomacy, and we were talking earlier about independent capacities for international organisations. Ever since at least um, the UN Special Commission on Iraq, I remember people have been talking about equipping the United Nations with more technical capacity to to understand what's happening um, from a military perspective and also to be able to play a more direct role in monitoring. Um, I, I think everybody on the panel has agreed that we're at a structural change, which in theory should unlock the possibility for more radical political decisions. Um, could we be at a point where the UN is more effectively equipped in terms of its international staff to, to play a more direct role? But, but you should feel free to say whatever it was you were planning to say. Um, yeah, I mean, on that first point, um, something that came home to us in the UN bubble in 2014 was that uh, the UN had virtually no expertise on European security. And the reason for that is quite obvious. It was that uh, the UN was sealed, um, was rightly seen to have failed in Bosnia in the 1990s and uh, for 20 years, excluding Cyprus and, and Kosovo. You know, the UN's focus was it was on Africa, it was on Afghanistan, it was on Haiti. There was no one in the organization who was really thinking uh, about European security. And it remains the case that it's an organization that is, um, you know, primarily focused on Africa and the Middle East and has uh, you know, some good people, but only a very thin layer of good people dealing with Europe. And the same is also true, actually, for East Asia. Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, the UN will try to bolster its staff in covering those areas, but I, you know, I, I don't think that fundamentally the UN is is going to shift back into being uh, a significant player in European security as it was for good or ill in the early 1990s during the unprofor the unprofor period. Um, I mean, just two other points. Uh, firstly, about. Um, Guterres as a mediator. I think that it's worth noting one interesting thing, which is that I think one of the reasons that Guterres working with Erdogan was able to get the grain deal is that um, Moscow is aware that um, a, a lot of the countries that it wants to hold on to in the global south wanted the grain deal. 
And so Guterres is essentially able to get some political capital from African countries, from Middle Eastern countries behind this initiative. Although he, I don't think he could have done that without the Turks, but nonetheless, he, he, has, he sort of harnesses the global South. And you know, that, that, mean, that is an interesting global dimension um, to his participation because the Russians are quite worried about holding on to their you know, residual friends in places like Mali. And Guterres can take advantage of that in his, his diplomacy. Um, the UN has also been useful as a place for the US to engage with uh, the developing world on food security issues, for example, um, and, and try and win over some goodwill on, on food security, which has become uh, a sort of a big source of concern related to Ukraine. So the UN does have other forms of utility um, away from Ukraine itself. Uh, just very quickly, one of the questions in the chat was whether we would see a UN disengagement observer force for Ukraine. Um, Andrew answered that in one word, no. Um, I would say no, but with a small caveat. Um, I can imagine if you have if you have a situation where you do have to just go through verifying the steps of some sort of disengagement you will need so you might need some sort of third party observation of that um it could be un it could be osce it could be a completely independent um uh verification mechanism which the un could sort of provide some support to but we're talking about very very lightweight stuff indeed prior to the war we were talking about 25000 peacekeepers for donbass that that dream has gone, um, sadly. But you, you, you could imagine some sort of third party verification. And to be quite honest, I don't really care whose flag is on it, um, as long as it's got the sort of the right people doing the job. Okay, thank you. Um, I should say I'm, I'm under quite heavy manners from the technical secretariat of this conference. So we, we actually have to finish on time, um, which means we, we need to wrap up uh, fairly soon. But um, Julia, I'm certainly going to come to you, and, and this could almost be your kind of final concluding remarks, which take us to the end of this session. So uh, please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I will try to be brief in order for the gentlemen also to comment. I just wanted to comment uh, to clarify uh, for Andrew. So when we talk about negotiations with Russia, it doesn't mean that we're expecting them to happen in a pause, actually, when both sides are exhausted right now. Uh, because uh, negotiations will end up also uh, as a peace settlement when Ukraine will restore its uh, territorial integrity in borders 1991. This is a consensus in Ukrainian society now, and we are predetermined to go on with this particular route. So until uh, Russia is defeated on Ukrainian soil, we never uh, will come back to this idea of negotiations. And we want our Western partners actually to understand and uh, uh, to leave us independently deciding on this point. Uh, so therefore, it's not something we, we are quite well aware about uh, Russian streak and not going to make this pause in order for Russia to beef uh, up. And we actually, with Globsec, drafted five scenarios uh, how the security situation will be developing until the end of 2023. And actually, out of five scenarios, only one contains element of uh, uh, negotiations with Russia. And again, uh, uh, when the territorial integrity of Ukraine is restored, unless the West will be pressing Ukraine before Crimea is uh, retaken by Ukrainian side. Uh, so um, this is uh, probably uh, what I wanted to say and uh, wanted to comment a bit briefly to Richard with regard to Guterres' role in this Green Deal. So uh, definitely it comes what you said, it's come about personal agenda of negotiators, so actually why it enters, a mediator especially, why he enters at negotiation situation. Uh, but don't forget also that uh, Russians, in parallel to this Green Deal with Ukraine, uh, with expert of Ukrainian goods signed a memorandum for, uh, directly with Guterres about the export of fertilizers and agriculture for three years. So uh, right now there will be a testing point for this grain deal on the 19th of November and we'll see uh, what Russians will play next. But hopefully I think that this time when Russians are already seemingly losing their negotiation position and uh, Turkey is actually emerging as a sort of solid broker alongside with the UN, uh, I, I don't think that they will will be a lot of difficulties actually to uh, extend this agreement, uh, but Russians uh, still will be playing their game. Thank you.
Thank you. Yes. Um, so as I say, we're coming to conclusion. Uh, I, I'd just like to give anyone who wants to take the floor the opportunity to make any final remarks um, um, that they want to before we before we conclude. Um, yeah, please, Andrew. Yeah, just wanted to uh, uh, say to Yulia that uh, if that's if that's the approach that what you're really talking about is focusing on getting sufficient military assistance from the West to actually have a decision on the battlefield that may create the conditions uh, for negotiation. So we're on the same page here. I, I, I misunderstood. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, Richard, please. Uh, yeah, Yulia, just to say, I completely agree that uh, Russia will continue to play games about the grain deal. I mean, I would say that if there's one group of people who know a lot about negotiating with the Russians, it's UN humanitarian officials, because for 10 years, um, UN humanitarian officials have been dealing with Russian games over Syria. And we are very, very attuned to the on off, you know, turn on the deal, turn off the deal, threaten to close the deal um, games the Russians play. Um, so actually, uh, you know, the UN may not have much leverage over Russia, but it has, maybe it has a bit more sort of an understanding of Russian negotiating tactics than some others. Um, but I think this time, uh, I would, I would place a, a small bet on the grain deal surviving at least the next, um, uh, the next sort of checkpoint, which you mentioned. Thank you so much, William. Some final remarks? I would say I'm more pessimistic about the future of the OSCE than I've ever been. I think there's a real chance that uh, Russia will pull out of it um, because I don't think they see any interest in trans military transparency at all until they see themselves as a status quo power. Maybe Finland and Sweden will change some of the balance of power. Certainly, I think Ukraine joining the alliance would change the balance of power enough that Russia might become status quo state again. But I do think the IAEA model, which everyone loves so much, uh, go work at the IAA for a little while and listen to how much the Russians scream at the international staff there for not being neutral and how much they're angry about the role that you know, Grossi has played, which I think is extraordinary. I think he's the best DG we've had in, in forever. Um, but Russia's not happy with this at all. And so the idea that the OSCE is going to develop multi multinational teams, uh, I, I, again, I don't think Russia has an interest in that at all. And, and we'll see. Um, I, I'd be happy if it can survive because I do think the tools are great and I believe in them. But I think we might be ending the entire era of post-Cold War cooperative security. Well, as in conclusion, um, just two things, really, I suppose it, it's impossible, obviously, to summarize the conversation, but I guess we've basically talked about three things. Um, the fact that hard power is now a much more important and salient issue. Um, the need for um, much more attention to be paid to understanding uh, Russia's positions um, and have a more granular understanding of why Russia does what it does and how it does what it does. Um, and finally, to equip diplomacy in a way that it can get out of the situation that everyone has described of being either marginalized or, or in certain cases irrelevant. And these are three questions we'll have to return to. Uh, but Thomas, please. Just uh, very briefly, uh, um, you know, uh, me, we all may have favorite ways of, of how this war should end but we don't really know and since we don't really know i know i, I would advocate of preserving as many uh, multilateral uh, tools as possible be it for you know facilitating aspects uh, uh, even though i would of course uh, totally agree uh, with uh, i think everybody's assessment that uh, it won't be the un nor the oec that is gonna uh, you know mediate uh, uh, the political strategic negotiations between um, uh, Ukraine and Russia, but you know there might be you know tasks coming up. There might also be a moment uh, where you know we see uh, Russia moving back uh, from a revisionist uh, to a status quo country, and then uh, we uh, would kind of you know be interested to reintroduce some 
aspects of cooperative security. And uh, for this uh, uh, to facilitate, I think it would be good. And, and that would basically be my message to preserve these uh, multilateral platforms uh, today. And, uh, and, and, and also, you know, to develop the necessary political commitment to preserve them and not just to let them uh, go. And, um, and, 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 and frankly, uh, Bill, I, sh I share your uh, uh, pessimism regarding the OEC at this point in time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, in closing, uh, I'd just like to remind the audience uh, that this is the first day of the Stockholm Security Conference, but we'll continue for the whole week. And um, the conference will restart tomorrow at 11 Central European time uh, with a panel focused on how Asian countries are reacting to the war in Ukraine, uh, the geopolitical implications of what's happening in Ukraine for, for the Asian region. Um, so welcome back tomorrow and uh, many, many thanks to this fantastic panel for, for helping us to, to have such a rich conversation. Um, thank you again. And with that, um, the session is closed. Thank you, Ian.